Welcome to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church and to this special adult education event that is also being live streamed. I want to extend a special welcome to the far-flung family members of this congregation who are watching from, well, at home or wherever it is that you are checking in uh, today. Uh, we have a very special event uh, planned uh, for this afternoon. I do want to, to say that in, in terms of our format, um, we will be passing out pieces of paper, right, Jamie, so that people can write questions, and those questions will be funneled up to me so that I can read the question out loud and so that our friends on live stream um, can uh, hear them. And also, if you're on live stream, you are encouraged to type your questions into chat, um, and that way they will eventually make their way up here to this table uh, through the magic of the electronic universe, and, um, and we'll get them asked. We'll ask as many questions as we have time for. I do want to let everybody know that uh, we have to end on time. We have to end at 1.30 because we have a funeral today downstairs at 2 o'clock. And so for those of you who are in person, I just ask that as you exit uh, the church today, be aware that the family will have already started gathering for the funeral. And so please be quiet and respectful as you move through the lobby and out onto 55th Street. Without further ado, I want to welcome here uh, today uh, my friend, uh, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church parishioner, um, Julie Chen Moonves. Uh, Julie is the host of the immensely popular television show Big Brother. She is, has a career as a news anchor. She is a multiple Emmy Award winning host and writer of the CBS morning show The Talk. She is spouse to Leslie, mother to Charlie, sister to Gladys and Vicky, who is here today. Uh, and she's also a living meme, which she may get, I may ask her to explain what that means later in the, in, the, in the service, but to my kids, that is like the super coolest thing in the world if you're a living meme. Um, I want to thank you so much, Julie, for being willing to talk with us today about your new audiobook, But First, God, which is out via Simon & Schuster, you can find the link. We've got the link uh, on our website, um, and uh, we'll make the link available to all of you who are here. I believe that Sean McAvoy has some cards with the link on it so that you can purchase it. I have enjoyed listening to this book um, in uh, recent weeks during my commute uh, down Fifth Avenue to the church. It is a marvelous, rich, honest take on what it means to be a fairly new Christian. And so I want to start there, Julie. Would you describe yourself as a fairly new Christian? And if so, what does that mean? That means, so I became a Christian five years ago. And I would say five years ago, I was like a newborn, uh, learning the language, learning how to speak, learning everything. And so only five years in, I'm probably like a first grader, if you will. Um, and because of the pandemic, you know, I really had a lot of time to kind of um, learn quickly a lot about the Bible and the character of God. And thanks to virtual services around the country and YouTube, like that's when my... Um, walk with Jesus really kind of took off because I had time and resources. So in 2018 to, you know, March, April uh, 2020, it was a little bit um, going to church on Sunday for an hour and then going back to my regular <laughs> life and self the rest of the week. It was almost like checking a box. Um, but then I really learned, uh, I I learned during early pandemic through a friend who became a pastor. He was a cameraman with me uh, where I worked in local news as a reporter in Dayton. And he um, 
has become a pastor and pastors a church in Boston, and he said, you know, this is not about, Christianity is not about religion, Julie. It's about a personal relationship with Christ. And, you know, I kind of, I heard it, but I didn't really know what that meant. And as I started to um, kind of meditate on what he said um, and realize, like, Prayer for me is going to look one way and it's going to look very different for, you know, all of us in this room. I started to understand like, oh, you know, it's not like I have to be in a church building and, and like this with my eyes closed. It could be, you know, driving to school or, you know, just sitting by myself anywhere, you know, just looking out the window. Um, so there is still so much for me to learn about um, God and his word and uh, my purpose here and um, community and, and how I can see the reflection of Christ in everyone that I meet. Uh, so I, I am a, a very new Christian, very new Christian. In, in the book, you describe in this sort of delightful manner all the different churches that you're sort of plugged into. I, it reminded me there's this, there's this joke that pastors tell to each other of a guy who was, you know, stranded on a desert island, and they find him five years later, and there are three buildings on the island. So they say, what are these three buildings? He says, well, that one over there is my house. And they say, well, what's this one? He says, well, that's my church. And they said, well, what's that one? And he says, well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but, but you have five churches that you still are plugged into. What's that like? I mean, pastors assume that would make you kind of religiously schizophrenic, but you seem to be gleaning interesting things from all of them. H how do you put it all together? Well, thanks to virtual services, um, I can be yoked with, because I live in Los Angeles, and the way I came to uh, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian was I would typically come to New York where I was born and raised in Queens. I would typically come for Christmas. And um, I do have an apartment here. And on Christmas Eve, I looked at, and I, and I like Presbyterian churches. Uh, when I decided to start going to church, my mom uh, researched for me. She said, I think you will like a Presbyterian church because it's, it's they, it's the easiest to understand the sermons. They just kind of speak very plainly, you know, very, and it's true, and I, before she told me this, I went to a Catholic church near me, and I walked out, and I didn't connect with anything. You know, it might as well have been in Latin. I mean, I think it was in Latin. I didn't understand anything. I walked out, uh, and then the next week, I went to the Presbyterian church near me. But um, to answer your question, what was your question? What is oh, five, like churches. five churches. So, in your head? I, because I live in Los Angeles, so my friend in Boston, I will zoom on to church from there, from from LA at 8 a.m., and then by 9:30 a.m., I am at the church uh, in Beverly Hills near my house, and then I'll come home, and in the afternoon, as a family, we'll watch. Fifth Ave, and sometimes I spend uh, time at the beach in Malibu, and they I'll go to their Presbyterian church, and or I can watch their sermon on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and the last church was oh I, so thank so it was Christmas Eve, and I knew I was having dinner a, half a block away, and I had to look at the services um, for this church, how it fell on Christmas Eve, and then Central, which is the Presbyterian Church, a few blocks from my apartment. And the services here were, fell at, at a time that was more convenient for me to get into Christmas Eve service. So that's, and that was in 2018, and that's how I got connected here. And then because of the pandemic, I could watch every week. I didn't have to be here. Um, so that's what five churches look like. Fifth Avenue Presbyterian, Central Presbyterian. I'll listen to them sometimes. 
Malibu Presbyterian, Beverly Hills Presbyterian, and then Roslyn, uh, Roslindale Baptist Church in Boston. So you, when you were a child, when you were growing up, and I'm going to make sure that Vicki's nodding when you give this answer because she'll, she'll know the truth on this. Um, there w religion was something that was happening in your, your family. So you say you, you, you came to Christ, though, five years ago. And the way you describe it in the book, this is, this is reason enough alone to get this book. You talk about going through a period of pretty intense suffering. Um, and I wonder if you could just reflect on that a bit. I mean, I and, and you caught flack from a lot of people. Like, Andy Rooney threw shade on you. Like, what's that guy's problem? But, <laughs> I mean, it, but really, the intense period of, of suffering um, and struggle, how did that bring you to faith? Well, or tip you over the edge into faith? Well, before I got tipped over the edge into faith, the, the Andy Rooney criticism didn't do it. But what the Andy Rooney story is, is that in um, the year 2000, I had just been a few months on the job of being uh, a morning news anchor for CBS News. And a few months in, they uh, asked me to be host of Big Brother. And I always, at that point in my life, had um, career aspirations of being a 60 Minutes correspondent. So I asked the head of CBS News who said, you know, we think you should also every week fly out to LA and host this new reality show called Big Brother. I said, well, if I do that, am I ever gonna be allowed to be a 60 Minutes correspondent? And Because I don't really see it happening. And he said, probably not. And I said, well, thank you. Uh, then I'm gonna turn down this job. And his reply was, well, if you don't take the job, we could technically assign it to you and if you turn it down, that could be seen as insubordination. So I was like, when's the next flight to Los Angeles? I'd love to host. And so when I hosted it, Andy Rooney went to the New York Post. Actually, I think the New York Post called him to ask him his opinion of me doing both jobs. And he said that I should that I was blurring the lines between news and um, news and entertainment and I should be fired from CBS News and permanently shipped off to the West Coast and just work for the entertainment division. Um, and you know, I was like 29 at the time, only at the network a few months and that didn't, <laughs> that didn't lead me to faith, but now that I look back, it should have. I think I was just so overwhelmed and, and, and immature and, and busy, I, di I didn't know what to make of it. But in 2018, at this point, my life was uh, very busy, and I had all these false idols, work being the biggest false idol, that came first in my life. And I'm married, my husband was running CBS, uh, we have a young son, and I have two jobs. At that point, I did leave CBS News. I was uh, co-hosting a daytime talk show on CBS, five days a week, called The Talk, and then, <laughs> Um, three months out of the summer, I was hosting Big Brother, and all of a sudden, um, my husband and I both were forced to step down from our jobs, me leaving the talk. And what happened was we were about to launch, my husband had stepped down from CBS, and I was about to launch the ninth season of the talk and I got a phone call from the head of CBS Daytime and she said uh, two of your four co-hosts have informed me that they don't want you at uh, work tomorrow when we launch the show because we're going to discuss your husband leaving CBS and they're not comfortable talking about it in with you at the table. So I thought it was just going to be one day where I wasn't at work but when I turned on the show, it was like watching my own funeral. And when these two co-hosts, when they spoke about the whole situation, it was clear I was never gonna be able to sit at that table again. So when I made my, my announcement that I was leaving, um, I made it seem like it was my choice, but it really wasn't. 
and I was still um, hosting Big Brother, but we only had a few weeks left. So when I signed off a few weeks later, I didn't, I didn't have a job. My husband didn't have a job. We were two very busy, career-minded people who suddenly were home all the time. My son didn't know why we were home all the time. That was like the best, worst thing to happen to him, <laughs> for me to suddenly be aware of everything he's doing. And um, it was during this time of um, darkness, frustration, anger, um, confusion, that I suddenly started to look up for answers. And I suddenly started to have time for God. And I had thought about going to church for a while, but I never did it until one morning. It was, uh, so I left the talk in September. And it was right after Thanksgiving, a few months later, that my aunt, who was my favorite aunt, she's a born again Christian, she emailed me. She and my uncle are born again Christians. He sur he's a cancer survivor and a 9-11 survivor. He was in the North Tower when it got hit. And um, she emailed me and she said, you, uh, I've never tried to push my faith on anyone in the family. We have a large family. She said, but my friend Angela from my church um, has been touched by God and Angela said, you need to tell your niece about Jesus Christ. And she, she and her husband will then know peace that transcends all understanding. And it was this um, loving email at the hands of a woman that didn't know me, didn't know my husband, was praying for both of us and our family, our son. That day, I went to a church, and it was a Thursday morning. I dropped my son off at school, and I walked into a church I had driven past millions of times near my house. It was the Catholic Church. There are three churches in a row. And I don't know how, I don't know when you unlock your doors, but it was strange to me that at like 8.20 in the morning, you know, this the, the church was open and I just walked in. And I had the whole place to myself. And I got down on my knees and I just sobbed and I, and I asked for guidance and for answers and for help. And, and I asked for hope and I asked for God to come into my life. And that's when it all started. So it is, unfortunately for many of us, it is in a dark time that we finally acknowledge God when we need help. And it is in the darkest times that the light shines the brightest. And that's when my journey began. That's incredibly powerful, and it's also, I think, Julie, just so consistent with what we see in the stories of the, of the faith of, you know, people finding God, you know, not when they're skipping down the yellow brick road and everything's happy, but, you know, in, in times of, of trouble. Um, and our tradition consistently says that. So thank you for being uh, you know telling us that that's a kind of a powerful story just you know a personal story you're sobbing in a in a in a catholic sanctuary in california what did it what happened next i mean you know you made this request of god mm -hmm. what happened well i started to only go to church on sundays and it wasn't every Sunday, but it became, um, if I skipped a Sunday and I decided to sleep in, I found that um, I didn't get that one hour of peace that I could get when I went to a Sunday service. So I started to go more and more. And as I started to go and I found like, oh, this is so peaceful for an hour a week. Um, I then knew I wanted to expand it and have my son come with me. My husband is Jewish, but he's culturally Jewish. He's not religious at all. So I um, asked my son to come with me to church the following Sunday, and suddenly my son, he was uh, in third grade then, he suddenly became Jewish. He was like, I'm Jewish. I'm like, Dad, I'm Jewish, Mom. I'm not going to church. 
So I said to my husband, I'm like, listen, you got to do me a solid. Like, this is what Charlie's saying. He said, okay, we're all going. So the next Sunday, he said, come on, Charlie, put your shoes on. We're all going to church. And this is how God works. So we go into church, and we're singing our first hymn. And I'm going to open up the book. And my husband is not even looking at the book, and he's singing louder than anyone else in the sanctuary. And he's so happy, bouncing around. And he, I go, how do you know this song? And he goes, don't you know this song? He's like, we sang this in school growing up. It's a, he goes, it's a Thanksgiving song. And I said, wow, I, I don't know it. And then that day, the sermon was as if it was written, handwritten for my husband. And the pastor was talking about how his good friend was going through a very dark time because he was accused of doing something that he didn't do. And it just stayed with us as, as a couple. And I saw my husband's shoulders come down in that church service where I saw peace in, in him that I hadn't seen um, for, for a long time. And when I, I think when I saw the change in my husband, that opened up a part of my heart and a part of my brain to God's word and God moving um, in, a, in a new pr profound way. And I said, okay, it doesn't matter where we are we're traveling. I'm going to find a Presbyterian church. We went to Singapore to go visit my family, and I went to a Presbyterian church there. Their services are a lot longer in Singapore. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, so things really, but I, I think things really started to change during the pandemic when I could zoom on to my friend's church and we were all just in boxes in our own home and hearing, seeing my friend who, who really transformed. I mean, this, this pastor, when I worked with him in Dayton, he did not know the Lord and he will be the first to tell you he was doing all sorts of ungodly things um, on the streets of Dayton. And I saw the transformation in him, but I always knew he was a he was a good guy, you know, from a really great family, one of eleven kids. But you know, you're young, you're growing up in Dayton. You, you know, it just many of us m make bad choices when we're growing up, and we don't have time for for God. Even if we grew up in the church, people go off to college and they suddenly forget God for a few years, and they they do whatever they do. But um, Things really started to change when I saw a friend um, take a personal interest in my walk with Jesus and was he and his wife. His wife was our producer in Dayton, and she's a deacon at their church now. Uh, and I hadn't talked to them in a couple of decades. I hadn't talked to them since 1997. And they reached out to me at my darkest time when a lot of people, you know, you find out who your real friends are. They, you know, I left Dayton. I, I became pretty successful. They never contacted me, never wanted anything from me. And it was when everyone else was scattering because my husband and I weren't in a position to be able to do anyone in, any favors. They came calling. And they had never met him. And they said, we are praying for you and Leslie and Charlie and our son. And they sent me my first Bible. It was a study Bible. I was like, What's that? What's a study Bible? And you can study the Bible on a Tuesday afternoon, you know? So it was, um, that's when things really started to change. And, and in one of his services, you know, he did like a Zoom type of altar call. And, you know, anyone who hasn't given their life to Christ who wants to, you know, we're here. And, and that day I said to him, I, I want to be baptized and I want you to do it. And then fast forward a few years later, October 9th of last year, I was, they flew out to California and I was baptized. And I know it's not the water that, you know, changes you, but there was something when I came out of that water before my friends and family and, and declaring this publicly that I did come out of the water, I feel changed. 
the way I would view the world, the way, the way I saw things, you know, I would suddenly like stop and see the reflection of God in, in the clouds, in that cactus, that suddenly, that cactus plant is shaped like a heart at the top. You know, I started seeing God everywhere that I just, you know, they say stop and smell the roses. Like I stopped and smelled the roses and saw God in, in every living thing. Um, I grew up like bugs would freak me out. <laughs> Suddenly I'm like, look at that beautiful centipede. You know, like <laughs> I'm not scared of it. And it's, that's amazing. God created that. So um, things started cha to change from, from the inside and it changed how I viewed things, how I spoke, um, how I think about things, how I react to things. Um, so it really started change, changing me on the inside. Then you saw it on the outside. Yeah, that, you've just described two different transformations, a transformation that happened when you were at worship service with, with, with Charlie and Leslie and, and, and Leslie's shoulders, you know, dropping a weight and then the transformation for yourself. And, you know, as I said this morning, I'm, I'm a church geek. I've spent my entire life in church. But it is somewhat gratifying to hear somebody tell a story and say, I found in churches a repository of wisdom and hope and, you know, the power of reconciliation and strength to move forward. It's, a, it's an exciting thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip around within your book. One of my favorite chapters in your book is the chapter about prayer. And in that, you talked about learning how to pray by watching other people pray. And I was like, this is perfect. Could you tell yes. us about how you learned to pray by watching other people pray? Yes. So on Zoom Church with Roslindale Baptist Church, every Wednesday we do Zoom Bible study. And at the end, they take prayer requests. And I would watch my friend's wife, who is a deacon, again, a, a deacon at the church, the most common prayer request is always something health related. Can you pray for, you know, my mom, my, my spouse, my sister, you know, someone struggling with cancer, just got diagnosed. And I would see, and I would see my friend's wife pray for God's wisdom to guide the doctors and anyone and every, everyone who lays hands on that patient. So it's not just, you know, please pay for so-and-so to get through. No, we're, we're praying for the doctors to, to open their hearts and their minds and to be guided by God's wisdom when they perform the surgery, when they're treating the patient. Um, that was huge. And in the beginning, my prayer, my prayers in the beginning, in 2018, it sounded like a Dear Santa letter. It was a one-way street, and it was, it was like, God, I want this, I want that. It was like a laundry list. And then watching other people pray for, for other people, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I should not be praying so much for myself. I should be last. I should be praying for everyone else. Then I saw um, my prayer life change because I would see my friend, the pastor in Boston, he always started prayer with praise. Even just the simple praise of like, thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for the power and the privilege of prayer. So my prayer life started to change where I would try and practice not asking for anything and just thanking God in my prayers. You know, thanking for allowing me to get out of bed this morning, live today, physically get out of bed, have clean drinking water, you know, have air in my lungs, the capacity to speak, to smell, to communicate, to do something of service for someone else today, whether I know them or not. Uh, so that's how I, I learned, you know, prayer is not about a dear Santa letter <laughs> for what you want. Um, and it's really giving thanks to him. Any, communi any communication. When you think you're talking to yourself, you're not talking to yourself. You're talking to God. I, th 
I, I commend uh, that chapter to everyone's here and everybody's watching online. I think it's really a powerful and honest kind of, you know, exploration of what it means to pray. In, in the book, you have this phrase that comes up a number of different times in which you talk about putting your Jesus glasses on. Yeah. Now, what does it mean to put your Jesus glasses on? It means try and look at any situation or any person the way Jesus does. Um, it means having love and patience in all circumstances for all people. So, you know, we, sure, there are plenty of people in my life that um, – maybe I'm like oil and water with, or that, you know, I perceive as my enemy, it might mean putting my Jesus glasses on and finding the treasure in that person. Because I'm sure some people look at me as I'm their enemy, or I get on their nerves. And I just pray they look at me with Jesus glasses on. So how, how, can, how does Jesus see that person, and how could I see that person the way Jesus does? Because Jesus loves that person just as much as he loves me. So that, that's what that means. In the book, y y you walk this incredibly fine line, and, and I was sort of in awe of it. Um, you're a public figure. All public figures catch more than their fair share of criticism and nastiness in the world in which we live. Um, and yet somehow you seem to be able to kind of sift through that and find things that are like, oh, yeah, this person was right. This, that's, I was wrong about this. And yet there are other times when you're just like, I needed to let that go. That was wrong. How do you find that sense of equilibrium? I, I get asked this question a lot in this world by, by people in the congregation, by people that, you know, attend to us from the far-flung family. You know, how do I find this place where I'm not so calloused that I can no longer listen to any criticism of myself, mm. and then, but also that I cannot become crushed, you know, by everything that's said that is just wacky. You, know, you see what I'm saying? That's the line that I think you walk throughout the entire book, and I was just like, wow, to be somebody who can do that, you're, you're, You've got a tough enough skin, but it's not so tough that you, you deflect everything. Yeah. Well, sometimes you have to consider the source. You know, some of the criticism that I got that I'm like, well, they kind of have a point. You know, um, for example, I am known as the Chen Bot because of my robotic-like delivery on Big Brother. <laughs> And when someone on the internet came up with that nickname, they backed it up with proof where they edited together all the episodes where I say these two little words that I'm known for on Big Brother, which is, but first. You know, it's like, this is happening, but first. And I was robotic, it was like, but first, but first, but first, but first. But first. And, then, and, I, and I watched this video and I burst out laughing in my office. I said, I am the Chen bot. <laughs> and I knew th it, was, it was meant as an insult, and it stung, but I was like, they're not wrong. <laughs> so there was that, and then there are other times when you read things that um, have no merit, and, you know, sometimes it's anonymously <laughs> written, and sometimes it's just flat-out lies, and I just think to myself, like, you don't know what that, what kind of darkness that person is going through or what their agenda is, but I can't give it any power and I just have to let it, you know, the more I let it consume me, the more power I'm giving it and the more power I'm giving that darkness, so I just don't feed it. Um, yeah, you have to read everything with discernment. I think that's incredibly healthy and, and, and more difficult than you, you, than we may imagine uh, for somebody in, in your position. Um, so I'm, I've been trying to think about what kind of Christian you are, all right? And we talked about new Christian. And so, uh, you know, I'm in the biz and I think about this kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, 
And and you you've got a fair amount of California in your Christianity. Um, and and by that I mean, I've always, I mean this with um, appreciation. This is not a criticism. There's a sort of closeness that you express that you feel to Jesus that I find in California Christians. They're just they're. There's like me and my surfer buddy Jesus, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, or going down the road of life together. And there's, there's, there's every California Christian I know, including my colleague Charlene Han Powell. I used to give her a hard time about this because uh, when she would pray, it was it was different the way than the way I pray, you know. Um, and and they're both I think legit, but she would always. It's, you know, you would get this feeling that, that she and Jesus were buddies. Right. We're very casual. We're yes. comfortable and casual. We're not yes. like. Yeah, exactly. I do struggle with that because I do remember hearing once. So there's this uh, British uh, Bible teacher by the name of David Pawson. And he, you can watch his uh, Bible teachings on YouTube called Unlocking the Bible. He's an amazing man. Um he died at age 95 on the day of ascension in May of 2020. Okay, mm -hmm. I thought, that's just perfect, right? And, okay, you have to remember, he's British. And he said one time, like, oh, you know, if the Queen of England were coming over, you would get dressed. So why don't you get properly dressed for church? And I was like, oh, that's a very good point. But the California Christian in me is like, Come as you are, uh, right? As Jesus says, just yep. come to the table. Mm. All are welcome. Yep. So you're right. You're right so, about that. Yeah, but it is a California thing. But there are times I struggle with that because I grew up here in New York, and the East Coast is way more proper than West Coast. You know, we do not wear white jeans after Labor Day or a white belt. You know, so that. But I went to college in Southern California, so. I started to kind of bend those rules a little bit, which is why I am kind of a California Christian, very casual. <laughs> I think one of the strengths of, of, of the California Christianity is an understanding of God's role in your life, in your relationships, in helping you out to sort out things like, you know, uh, forgiveness, broken personal relationships, um, I think one of the strengths of East Coast Christianity is trying to find where Jesus is having us look at, like, the news of the day. So, in other words, like, immigration. You know, what does faith want us to do about that? So, one side is, is, is a faith that really sees Christ involved in your personal, everyday relationships in life. And another is, like, faith and politics. You know, and and I'm I'm just wondering how, as somebody who's been both East Coast, I have an, I, I have a suspicion as to what your answer is to this because I think it's in the book. But um, uh, I just want to hear how do you reconcile those as you're moving into this this new realm of being a Christian? Um, is it all just me, Jesus, and me figuring out how I relate to my sister and my friend? Um, how, when does it cross over into me, Jesus, and how it makes me think about the big problems that the world is facing? Well, I think that's part of the reason why we love, oh, I just realized there's a sixth church. See, this is the problem when I travel. See, look at that. You're out of control. And, it's, <laughs> and I have you to thank because I asked you when uh, my husband and I were going to Paris a year ago, I said, is there a good English-speaking Presbyterian church you can recommend? And then you said, I think you'll like the American church in Paris because Pastor Paul Rock used to be part of Fifth Ave. So there's another church. I, and that one was one of the main ones. Central, not so much anymore. And Malibu, not so much. But yeah, um, so ACP. So I think part of the reason we like listening to you and to their church is because they, b both churches always bring in the day's headlines and politics into the sermons. And as a matter of fact, the first sermon, the first service I went to, the only service I went to in person there in Paris was a sermon on um, 
how people try to weaponize Jesus politically. And um, that is something that I, as a public figure, I try and um, do whatever I can in my small sphere of influence to let people know I am a Christian and I'm not weaponizing Christianity. Um, I not trying to make my own political agenda out of um, my relationship with Jesus. Uh, sadly, and you know, people close to me, you know, in the beginning, they, were, they thought, they thought, oh, Julie becoming a Christian, like, is she still going to like me? I'm Jewish, and I'm like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one time a, a friend came over, and she is um, Jewish. And she saw me starting to wear a cross. And she, I saw her kind of go like this. And then she walked into the house. She's very funny. And she said to my husband, she goes, Julie does know you're, Je Ju Julie does know you're Jewish, right? And I'm like, what's that supposed to mean? People, because Christianity has been weaponized and people use it for their own political agenda, you've seen people who are extremely judgy and not welcoming to all, wear a cross, and thou they are Jesus people. I mean, think about January 6th, the riots, where people are violently acting out and carrying signs that say, Jesus 2020? I'm like, no, I'm going to pray for you, because that is not, this is not how Jesus <laughs> would behave or condone this. So um, there is a big East Coast part of me, and being a journalist, being a news person, where it's not just about me and Jesus, but I got to show up in the world and show people I, I am a Jesus follower, and I don't condone that and not about that. You know, which is why like, I like to sign off of Big Brother with one simple piece of scripture, which is love one another. Yeah. That's it. And it comes through, that, that is exactly the, the section of the book that I was referring to, is that the, your sense of welcome and hospitality has only been enhanced by your moving into deeper into your faith. And you talk about that elegantly in the book. You talk about, you know, a gay friend of yours who came up and said, hey, what's this going to mean for our relationship? And you were like, I love you more. Yeah, there you go. And, exactly. and and I thought that was just there is there is a sort of beautiful aspect to your sense of hospitality and the welcome that you extend in and through this book that's fantastic out there. I'm I'm sitting here, yes, I'm I'm looking to Jamie to see if there are questions because we've been talking, believe it or not, we have four minutes uh before uh we're gonna be done and so let's see if we can work in a few Okay, um, uh, so it's so special to know we can pray anywhere and at any time. As you walk daily with Christ, what does prayer look like during the intensity of your work, like on the set of Big Brother? On the set of Big Brother, I arrive and my assistant and I immediately pray, and then I get down to set for rehearsal, and we, my assistant and I, we pray backstage before rehearsal. And then before a live show, um, me and my small team, so it's hair, makeup, wardrobe, my assistant, the five of us, we hold hands and we do a prayer circle and we pray there. When uh, summer in 2020, when I was really coming into my own with my walk with Christ, I tried, I did pray out on stage. And um, some people loved it and thanked me. And then I was told, you have to make it very clear that you're not demanding everybody pray with you before a live show, you know, if they have other beliefs or they don't want to or they're busy. So then the next time I was like, you know, please, like this is me just trying to bless this broadcast as we're about to, you know, be live in four minutes. Don't feel like you need to pray. And then I just thought, you know, I, I, I don't, it didn't feel right. I didn't need to do that. So I just did it backstage with my little group. But it's funny because I'm wearing the live mic and my director will hear me. So sometimes he's like, let go, let God, or amen, hallelujah. Like he was telling me <laughs> my ear, earpiece. I'm like, yes. Um, so that's how, that's how it looks at work. 
it's funny. I gave at the end of summer 2020, like, like I like to do a little gift baggie for everybody. And in it, I put uh, a Bible. And I got a phone call from uh, someone at CBS. They're like, I'm embarrassed to even be calling you about this. Not not, it wasn't a complaint, but we got a phone call from someone who got your gift bag, and they were like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, what do I do with this? He's like, you just have to make it very clear, like, this is a personal gift from you, and it's not like, you better become a Christian if you want your job here next year, you know? And I was like, oh my God, like, if they didn't know what to do with it, like, you can give it to somebody else. You can give it to the homeless person right on the corner. You can give it to your grandma. You can give it to your neighbor. Like, you don't have to keep it, you know? Isn't that what regifting is all about? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what was your favorite part about recording the, the memoir? When I had to come clean about it wasn't my choice to leave the talk. I was about to record that um, passage, and I, and I looked at my producer, and I go, and he was with me at the talk, I go, John, I, this is lying. I can't lie. I'm like, it's my decision. I said, I was let go. Like that, I did not want to leave. We have to come clean. I said, you know the whole story. And that was very like <sighs> freeing. That was the best part. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something. I think that's in scripture. The truth will set you free. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let, me, let me end with this question. You are accomplished, you know, remarkable, uh, I mean, the Emmys, and you, you say in the book that you're most proud of the Emmy for writing, which I think is, is fabulous. Um, I want to, I want to say, what can the church, the modern church, learn from people who are in journalism and entertainment? What do you have, I mean, I, I, I believe that we can all learn from each other, and, and, and you've, been so eloquent about what you've taken away from the church of late. What can we learn from you? Well, I think you are doing an amazing job at, you know, you always read what's happening, um, whether you're pulling something from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. Um, I think we have to be less West Coast and more East Coast. Me, I think we have to call out hypocrisy, but do it from a space of love so they don't dig in and, you know, attack back. And, um, yeah, I think that's what modern churches can learn from journalism. You know, there's so few journalists and outlets out there that are not agenda-driven, and it's not God's kingdom agenda. So I think if we can all look at his agenda and his will ahead of our own personal ones, that's what we need to do. Amen. Listen, Julie flew in on the red eye on Friday night. Um, we've got in the back, uh, Jamie's holding up, we've got the, the link. Uh, it's, Ashley's got them too uh, that you can use to uh, purchase the book. Um, uh, we're so grateful for you. Uh, for your voice being out there in the world um, uh, and uh, for being part of this far-flung family. Bless you. Let's give her a warm <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Pardon me for having to slip quickly out the door to go downstairs uh, to preside at this funeral. Remember that there is a funeral taking place as you are exiting today.